Uh, this is an issue near and dear to my heart uh, in the work I do at Google, uh, as Peter mentioned. Uh, Google's been doing a lot of work over the last uh, over the number of years of working in energy uh, and working in ways to invest in technology that's innovative, both in generation of, of energy as well as being more efficient in the use of energy. Uh, we made investments of over $900 million over the years in renewable energy projects, including the largest solar thermal plant and the world's largest uh, 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 wind farm as well. And in, general, in addition, we made our, our data centers the most efficient in the world. Uh, they're about half as much energy used as most uh, typical uh, uh, data centers. And in addition to that, we worked really hard to eliminate our uh, effect on the global warming. And so we basically have been, since 2007, carbon neutral, both in our operational efficiencies as well as buying very high quality uh, offsets. Um, with that, let me do some introductions to this very distinguished panel. Uh, I want to first start with uh, Jim Davis, president of Chevron Energy Solutions. And then Ernest Moniz, the Cecil and Ida Green Professor of Physics, Engineering Systems, and Director of the Energy Initiative at MIT, and also the former US Undersecretary of Energy. We have David Victor, Professor of International Relations at the, at the School for International Relations and Pacific Studies at the University of California in San Diego, and Lori Weigel, from General Manager of the Eco Technology Office at Intel Corporation and President of the nonprofit Climate Savers Com Computing Initiative. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming this very distinguished panels who are very well, as Peter said, very well the experts in this field. I'm looking very much forward to their comments and discussion. Uh, we'll have a uh, we'll talk for about 10 minutes from each panelist and then some Q&A. And at the end, if you have, look in your seat, you'll see, you'll see a, uh, a card located on your seat for questions. Please give it to a World Affairs Council uh, person and they'll collect them at the, during the remarks. So with that, let's start with some questions and comments. With the, Sorry, uh, David Victor, since you're our first panelist. Um, could you give us a background on technology innovation, especially in the oil and gas industry, both in the US and abroad, and what the future holds for some of these game-changing technologies? Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for the World Affairs Council. And I also want to thank uh, Route 280 for opening up in the final moments, allowing me to be here uh, tonight. And uh, so you'd like us to make our 10-minute comments right, uh, right now. So I'd just like to say four things. Um, about innovation in the oil and gas. I've been asked to focus on oil and gas. Um, we, we, um, we think that there's a, there's a whole series of revolutions brewing in the energy business. Uh, and those revolutions as they unfold could transform energy and could lead to all kinds of new futures, hopefully with lower emissions of carbon dioxide and other warming, uh, warming gases and other pollutants and so on. And I think that's right. But I think we often forget that many of the same innovations that are making possible new visions for renewables, which Google.org has been doing a ton of work on, are also affecting the oil and gas industry itself. Um, new materials, big data, imaging, and so on. They, they, these are having a tremendous impact on the oil and gas uh, industry. And I think there's a decent chance, maybe better than even chance, that when we, we look back on this period of tremendous innovation in the energy space, that we actually see that this innovation has uh, overall had the effect of actually making fossil fuels a lot more competitive uh, than we might have originally thought. You may like that vision, you may not like that vision, I'm going to set that aside. I think it is plausible because uh, so much is happening uh, uh, here. Peter Robertson mentioned this discussion now about North America becoming a, a, a at least net independent of energy. Uh, Almost nobody expected that five years ago, certainly not 10 years ago. It's just, it's, uh, it's, it's tremendous. And it could well be that we look back on this period and we see the beginning of a world that's actually awash in fossil fuels, uh, not a world that's scarce in fossil fuels and where fossil fuels on their own are going to become more expensive and drive themselves out of business, but actually could be highly competitive. Second thing I'll say is nowhere is this more evident right now than in natural gas. Um, with the innovations surrounding uh, so-called fracking of natural gas. Ernie Moniz led a terrific team at MIT that did a big report on the future of natural gas. They've done terrific reports on the future of everything. Uh, but the report on gas um, really lays out. It's just extraordinary. I have never, and working in the energy issues for 20 years, never seen such a transformation uh, uh, in a major uh, set of technologies as we've seen now in the case of, uh, of, of fracking. I think at the same time we have to realize that the gas industry, maybe more than other aspects of the energy industry, is a kind of manic depressive industry. 
So it swings back and forth between moods. And so right now, everybody's ecstatic, or a lot of people are ecstatic because of what's happened in, in fracking and so on. Fracking has gone from essentially nothing to a large share of the U.S. gas supply. Seems likely to happen, to, to expand in the future. It is not obvious that that's going to continue. I think it will. I'm very bullish on it. There are a lot of serious concerns people have raised about emissions of warming gases. I tend not to be so concerned about that um, uh, because I think the industry is doing a reasonably good job there, but we have to measure that. A lot of really serious concerns about uh, water pollution and managing water that's produced as well as the huge amounts of water that's needed for some uh, so-called frack jobs. Seismic activities, earthquakes, um, all kinds of other things people are concerned about. And that's just here in the United States. So far, the a fracking, a shale gas industry hasn't really emerged outside of North America. You see some early inroads in the UK and a few other places and so on. But the structural property rights and competition in the US industry has been really very different and has allowed a competitive shale gas industry to, to flourish here. Not obvious that that's going to happen around the rest of the world. So we need to have some sobriety as to the extent to which this uh, uh, spreads globally. That's the second thing I wanted to say. And the third is there's, there's going to be a session in these four-part series later in January with Ed Moore's talking about geopolitics. I'm not going to say very much about geopolitics, but I will say that big new supplies, because of technological change, big new supplies of oil and gas are going to make these fuels much more widely available and certainly more, more widely available in North America, and that could have seismic effects on the traditional oil and gas producers and exporters. And Ed Morris will talk more about that in January. Um, I will say that the, one of the places you're gonna see this first is in Russia. Uh, Russia is a huge energy importer. Its economy depends, its government depends, Putin personally depends on the ability to control massive rents measured in tens of billions of dollars that are associated with oil and gas exports, in particular gas exports <coughs> to Europe. Um, and it, but it's a high cost place. It's a, it's, it's a place that has a legacy infrastructure pipelines, very high cost basis. If the world shifts to a lot more shale, uh, shale based fracking of natural gas and gas prices worldwide come down, as we've seen here in the United States, that's terrible news for Russia. Now, that might be great news for us. That's another point of debate and discussion and so on. But the geopolitical effects are going uh, are, are to be a big deal. I think that's still in the realm of speculation. One thing I will say very briefly in terms of, of, of effects of these innovations, in particular in shale gas, is we've already seen what appears to be a massive environmental benefit, which has been that no, low prices for natural gas here in the United States have made gas a lot more competitive with coal for generating electricity. That, along with much tighter regulations and future tighter regulations of coal plants, have uh, resulted in coal occupying. We used to have about half of U.S. electric supply. Now coal and gas are about even at the same, at roughly at parity. I have in 20 years never seen such a rapid shift for a major fossil fuel and electric power system. It's just, it's unbelievable. One of the effects of this has been that U.S. emissions of carbon dioxide, the leading cause of global warming, are down now by maybe 400 million tons a year. Uh, just because of the switch from coal to natural gas. Not because of a policy, we're delinquent on the policies, but just because of that switch. To put that number into perspective, that number is twice the worldwide effect of the Kyoto Protocol. So, so it's, it's huge. It's not going to stop global warming, but it's really huge. And the fourth and last thing I'll say very quickly um, is if you believe that this kind of epicenter, cluster of innovations, aren't just going to improve renewables, but are also going to make fossil fuels a lot more competitive, then I think we need to take the, extra, the next step logically, which is to think about um, what happens in particular to renewables and low carbon sources of energy in a world where fossil fuels and gas in particular are a lot more competitive. And we can already see the beginning of that here in the United States because it is an awful lot harder today than five years ago when gas was a lot more expensive to, to justify financially building a new nuclear plant, building a new um, uh, a renewable energy source, let alone the, the pending expiration of the production tax credit and so on. I want to say more about that because I know Ernie's going to talk about the landscape there, but I think when we look at, especially in electricity, you have lots of fuels competing and the, the landscape has really shifted in the direction of natural gas because of these innovations. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Uh, uh, Professor Moniz, or Ernie, sorry. Uh, could you discuss more of some promising next generation renewable uh, technology that are coming out and uh, the impact they might have on the industry? 
Yeah, thanks, Matthew. And, and also, let me start by saying uh, unapologetically that I will frame my remarks around uh, climate change uh, as the challenge that drives the time clock for transforming the, the, the energy system. We can talk about other challenges, but that's the one where the clock is ticking, uh, and, and I believe we have to accelerate the pace of change. Now, David has already talked about what is the true game changer today, which is, which is natural gas and what it's done, what it's done for CO2 emissions uh, uh, as well. And what we've seen there, as he said, is the most rapid transformation uh, of scale in the energy sector that either he or I have seen uh, uh, at all. However, we should not be deceived. The scale up of natural gas in this short time scale is the exception that proves the rule in the following sense. It's the nature of the business already of the energy incumbents. It fits their supply chains, it fits their customer bases, and therefore it could scale rapidly. We cannot translate that, perhaps unfortunately, to renewables, batteries, all kinds of new technologies that we are going to be talking about. So we have to face the issue that these are not going to happen in this way quickly, and that's in some sense the challenge now that I will, that I will talk about. Having said that, I also want to uh, remind uh, people that there is a long history of, to use today's term, decarbonization of fuels. Any of you who have seen Scott Tinker's, I think, interesting movie, Switch, and if you haven't, go see it, he will just draws a straight line. Take the market share of oil and coal, and the market share, we're including gas with nuclear and renewables, just draw them out and they cross in about 60 years. So batteries, renewables, et cetera, these are going to be I'm absolutely part of our future. The issue is we can't wait 60 years if we want to meet the climate change imperative. So then the question becomes, where do we stand in terms of the evolution of these technologies uh, on these, on these timescales? And, and, and in that context, by the way, I do want to say that with a certain sense of optimism, that when we see all the train wrecks out there, including uh, arguments about bankruptcies of this and that firm, we should keep in mind, long term, these are going to be a big part of our energy future, irrespective of a carbon policy, but I believe the latter will come in and will, in fact, accelerate where we're going. So I'm going to focus first on the, on the electricity sector uh, in the United States, the electricity sector, because if you look at the opportunities for decarbonizing, it almost certainly will be led by demand management and electricity. Displacing oil in the transportation sector is a harder job, and if we have time, we'll, co we'll come back to that. But let's, let's focus first on electricity. And one question right away is, and David basically raised it, is natural gas taking up all the oxygen uh, and, and killing renewables? I'm going to take a contrary view, but let me first uh, say, what are the options for going the low carbon or the zero carbon route in electricity? And there are fundamentally three. Renewables of a variety of types, hydro, solar, wind, etc. Nuclear power and carbon capture and underground storage following combustion of fossil fuels the technology that would make the world safe for coal. So those are the three uh, options. Solar. I think many of you know the, price, the, the, the cost drops in solar have been just stunning. Uh, we're talking 20% a year uh, reductions. We're talking now about crystalline silicon uh, photovoltaic modules at about 80 cents a watt. We can talk about thin films as well later on if one wishes. Just to put that in perspective, it wasn't long ago, it was $4, 20 years ago, $10. This is a tremendous drop in the module prices. In fact, the module price is no longer the controlling element of the system cost. Uh, so now we have to work equally hard on the system costs. I'm not going to go through all the arithmetic, but you can, you can do it yourself. Take whatever capital charge you want, 6% per year or whatever. Go through the arithmetic with rational assumptions. And what you will come out with is that in locations of reasonable sunshine, and I don't mean 
the Mojave Desert. I, I mean, you know, New Jersey. It's better when you have more sun. But uh, you go through that and you calculate a cost of electricity against the norm, the retail norm. And what you find is you are getting competitive for sure in a 10 to 15 year time scale. That actually undersells the technology from the point of view that if you build it, since the operating costs are very low, especially for photovoltaics, CSP is a bit more expensive, uh, if you build it, you know the electricity will be, if you like, accepted uh, in, uh, into the system. But even more important, as smart infrastructure comes in, and hopefully with it smart regulation, the value of solar will be enhanced compared to that baseline because it's producing electricity essentially when you want it, afternoon, uh, et, et cetera. So solar, uh, I think, is, uh, I'm very bullish on solar, but bullish in the, in the sense that we're still probably a decade away before the real ability to start scaling and then to begin addressing other problems uh, of, of very, very, very large <clears throat> penetration. <clears throat> but solar as one of the renewables, uh, again, uh, I think it is coming. It's going to have a very large market share eventually. The question is, can we accelerate it? Which then, of course, introduces all these issues of what are government policies, uh, 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 particularly in the face of natural gas. Nuclear. Nuclear today uh, is the largest uh, carbon-free source uh, in, the, uh, in the U.S. It's about a sixth of the world's electricity. There's obviously been a problem in uh, Japan with Fukushima. Nevertheless, I will just say at least my opinion, and we can argue this. Uh, I think in, the re in reality, the main issue for the future of nuclear power as a carbon-free source in the United States is one and only one thing. And it is, will the new plants being built in the Southeast be built on budget and on schedule? If they have the kinds of cost overruns we're seeing in, we've seen in some of the new European plants, toast. If they are built on schedule and on budget, they could be a very interesting uh, contributor to our carbon-free mix. It will depend on how issues of financing, et cetera, are managed because of the huge capital costs up front uh, and the premium uh, that's often called for uh, from, the, from the investors. But nuclear power should not be dismissed uh, as, as, uh, as part of the solution uh, if we, in fact, are trying to accelerate our response to climate, uh, climate risk. There is a new technology here, a possible game-changing technology called small modular reactors. The idea would be that instead of building these larger and larger 1,000 megawatt, 1,200 megawatt, 1,600 megawatt plants, one goes in the opposite direction and builds much smaller plants in the hope, and today it is nothing more than a hope, that economies of manufacturing such smaller plants can overcome the inherent economies of scale in going to larger and larger plants. That's a very interesting, long story, uh, which again, we could come back to, but uh, it is the kind of investment we need to make. None of this will move this up again to, below, to, to anything less than the 10 year or so time scale. Which in fact goes back to my comment I wanted to make about why I do not take the position that natural gas is sucking up all the oxygen. Rather, since I see the, all, the zero carbon alternatives all having 10 year or longer time frames, I will argue it's buying us time as long as it displaces coal. The caution is buying time doesn't matter if you don't use the time. So the formula is, in fact, for this 10 years, demand management, gas for coal, and innovate like hell so that the zero carbon alternatives can have cost reductions and can get driven into the marketplace uh, earlier. Carbon capture and sequestration, I think my time is running out, so I'll just make a comment there. 
I would say of these three alternatives, in my view, this is the most challenged. Uh, today it is too expensive, uh, and I believe we will need a new technology, not an extension, an evolutionary extension of the current technology for capturing carbon dioxide at lower cost. If we accomplish that, we still need to demonstrate to the public satisfaction that we can put in the, well, from, even from only one coal plant, several million tons of carbon dioxide per year, say for 50 years, into an underground capture reservoir. To give you a scale for a modest sized coal plant, not small, but say 500 megawatts, over the lifetime of that one coal plant, you should think of this underground CO2 reservoir as having about two billion barrels. That's a pretty big reservoir, and you've got to do that for a whole bunch of coal plants to be, be material. Now, the estimates are that there is plenty of capacity in principle, but one should not underestimate the infrastructure challenges uh, and the challenges of being able to manage that. So, frankly, I, I think it's very important that we pursue this and see if that dog will hunt. But I do think it is the most challenged, frankly, of these three uh, alternatives. If there's time, I'll talk about batteries, but I think that'll, we'll that'll come, come later. Right. Uh, thank you, Ernie. Uh, Lori Weigel, if you could uh, talk a bit about your insights on smart grid technologies, that'd be great. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to switch topics a little bit and talk about the intersection of information technology and energy. And I think a useful context to do that in is to think about CO2 emissions, um, which we talked about a little bit earlier. A few years ago, the climate group and Jesse uh, published a report called Smart 2020. It's a, a great title. Um, and in that, they documented that globally, um, information and communications technology is responsible for about 2% of emissions. Um, so that's fairly significant. A lot of people think that's about the same as airlines. So it's definitely worth focus. Um, Recently, data centers have, have kind of drawn all of the attention um, around computing and its contribution to carbon emissions and energy use. And, and again, I think that that's uh, justified. Uh, Dr. John Kumi, from, who's a Stanford researcher, uh, asserts that in the US, about 2% of our electricity is going to data centers. And globally, it's about 1.5%. Um, so it does deserve focus. But I also think we need to appreciate some of the work that's being done in, in terms of computer energy efficiency. Uh, one of the fundamental enablers of uh, greater energy efficiency is Moore's Law, uh, which is named for Intel founder Gordon Moore, uh, asserts that roughly every 18 to 24 months we can double the number of transistors in our microprocessors in particular. Um, Maybe our Intel researchers have too much time on their hands, but we did this little thought experiment to ask ourselves if you applied Moore's law over the course of its life to the automobile industry, what would the impact have been? So we looked at a, a 1971 Volkswagen Beetle <laughs> as the baseline. And if you applied Moore's law over uh, since, since 1971, uh, we'd be getting, or we'd be going 324,000 miles per hour, and we'd be getting 130,000 miles per gallon, and the car would cost about five cents. <laughs> so <laughs> we uh, obviously haven't made those same kind of gains in the automobile industry, but it is a really important fundamental building block that we do have for the computer industry. And you can see that if you go into a typical data center that's got some old IT equipment, that old IT equipment may be using about 60% of the power and doing about 4% of the work. So it's just a really uh, dramatic improvement that we're seeing. But we're not resting on just the individual uh, pieces of equipment. The industry's also focused on data center facilities overall. Um, and you mentioned that a little bit earlier. Uh, and here, it's a combination of technology, but also combining that with uh, metrics. You know, Andy Grove, uh, an, also an, an important icon for Intel, used to say, you can't improve it if you don't measure it. And so we've come up with this metric called power usage effectiveness. It's really a simple ratio 
that looks at the amount of power coming into a data center as the numerator and the amount of power that's going to the IT equipment that is actually doing productive work um, as the denominator. And when we first started measuring that in 2007, the Uptime Institute calculated that the average PUE or power usage effectiveness was about 2.5 which means that more than half of the power is basically being wasted. It's being used to cool and move uh, air around the data center. Uh, today, our PUEs are on average more like 1.8, and then you have some companies like Google that are down to the 1.1 and you know, really, really um, very, very efficient. So we're really focused on this, and I don't want anybody to take away from this that it's all done and you shouldn't worry about data centers anymore. We really continue the work there. But I think it's also interesting to go back to that notion of the 2% and the 98%. In that same SMART 2020 report, it was documented that information and communications technology could reduce the emissions in the other 98% on the order of 15 to 20%. So that's a huge opportunity, even bigger than optimizing the 2%. And what they, they talked about in that report were things like smart grid, green buildings, smart motors, better logistics so that we don't use as much energy and transportation of all forms, and enabling things like telework. I've been more involved probably in the smart grid and, and uh, green buildings arena in uh, that list, and so I'll talk a little bit about that. I just came back from Europe, from Amsterdam, from the largest uh, electric utility conference that they uh, put on there. And it was really interesting as an American to partic participate in that because there was a lot of cynicism about smart grid, um, which was pretty interesting, especially smart meters. And you know, I, I hadn't expected to hear that they thought the US was ahead. So that was kind of a, a nice comment to hear. But renewables are being deployed at a very rapid rate. And that's another area where even without the end-to-end -end smart grid, information and com uh, communications technology can be really important. We've talked for a long time about the fact that utility-grade wind turbines use 10 to 16 microprocessors. They're actually quite intelligent. And now we're working on actually uh, using the same kind of t uh, management technology that you use to maybe get a virus patch, antivirus patch on your PC to do remote management at offshore wind turbines. Much more efficient than sending ships out to, to uh, correct things. We can actually do it uh, using our compute and communications functionality. Uh, in the US, we're starting to see some of the uh, promise of big data come to bear. We heard about that a little bit earlier. We have a project that we're participating in in Austin called Pecan Street, where we have homes that have smart meters, they have rooftop solar, they have electric vehicles, and we're able to take that data into the computer center along with weather prediction and algorithms that can decompose electricity loads. And we're going to end up with the capability of doing the equivalent of a check engine light for your home. So we can have your utility send a message to you saying you probably need to change the filter on the refrigerator. It's not running as efficiently as it was a month ago. So a lot of promise there in application of information technology. In other parts of the world, you know, different areas are being emphasized. In China, we're seeing a huge build out of um, supercomputer functionality to do grid simulation and power dispatch um, as new transmission uh, capabilities are brought on. So, you know, again, a very different focus. But the third area that I wanted to talk about a little bit, which is uh, newer, in, uh, at least to me, and, and I think quite interesting, is the notion of bringing all of this together and using your IT equipment for IT but also making it a participant in the smart grid. And a couple of examples of that are we're working now on data center demand response. So making the data center a smart load for the, the electric grid. And that might be moving compute capacity to a different facility during a peak load event so that we don't have to bring on expensive generation. Or it might be as straightforward as doing most of the computing when there's a, the availability of renewable energy. So the wind's blowing, let's go crunch the numbers at, at that point in time. Secondly, motivated by emerging markets where we have isolated solar powering things like uh, computer labs for students, uh, we're starting to look at smart battery charging technology. So your mobile device, if it's plugged in, but 
the sun isn't shining, it shouldn't be charging the battery. It should just be drawing enough current to, to work. Same thing with a notebook computer. When the sun's shining, then go ahead and charge the battery. So being intelligent about that can help us fit into the um, distributed renewable scenario a little bit better. And then the last example is looking at how our typical IT equipment can be a participant in green building projects. Uh, we just completed an experiment in Japan with something called Personal Office Energy Manager, which basically uses the new sensing capability we're putting into PCs to uh, add instrumentation for the building system. So things like temperature and light levels that are in an office. If I take my computer and go to a conference room, the building system knows I'm not in my office. It can turn the lights off, et cetera. And we've seen uh, in definitely improved energy efficiency there, but also better engagement of the occupants and getting them to change their behavior. So um, that's been really helpful. So I think there's a huge amount of innovation going on here. They touched on just a few examples, um, but hopefully we'll have the opportunity to talk about it some more. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. Um, Jim Davis, if you could, um, you've heard a lot of very interesting technology has been discussed here in the role in energy. If you could talk a bit about uh, how those technologies can be scaled up and commercialized since you do a lot of that in your work. Great. Thank you, Matthew. So Chevron is a global energy company. And as we look for ways to meet the world's growing global demand for energy, which is expected to increase by over 30% between now and 2030, uh, we believe it's going to take all forms of energy to meet that demand growth. Um, certainly fossil fuels are going to play a major role, um, and uh, the professors have talked about the shale gas uh, revolution here in the United States and, and its role. Um, but we also see a big role for uh, all forms of energy, nuclear, uh, renewables. Um, but the, uh, the most plentiful, cheapest form of alternative energy there is is energy efficiency. Okay. So basically, you know, the energy that you don't use um, is the cheapest form of energy. And Lori just did a, a good job of talking about it in the, in the IT space, um, the, the opportunities for energy efficiency. Uh, the business that, that I lead for Chevron is called Chevron Energy Solutions. And we focus basically on, on three main markets. Uh, first is uh, externally the, the public sector market and the, and the U.S. federal market. Uh, so we go to city, county, state government facilities, as well as U.S. Uh, federal facilities like U.S. military bases and federal agencies like NASA, NASA Security Agency, uh, the U.S. Postal Service. And we look for ways uh, for them to both lower the demand for energy uh, through energy efficiency projects, as well as uh, look at the supply side, ways that we can produce uh, energy on site. So we'll go into a large university and we look at the entire building. You know, we look at lighting, HVAC, uh, heating, ventilating, and air conditioning. Sorry, we're, we're full of acronyms in this, in this industry. Uh, we look at motors, chillers, drives, boilers, windows, water conservation, roofs, um, and look for ways that we can economically reduce the demand, energy, uh, at that facility. And then we complement on the supply side. Could be solar, uh, could be uh, natural gas cogeneration could be a fuel cell. Uh, our business is technology agnostic. Uh, so we're looking for the best technology uh, or the best solution for that customer as opposed to uh, something that we manufacture and, and, and try to drive into the scope of that project. Um, then we do the same thing on the supply side. Uh, we look to match up uh, the best technology uh, for that demand. Uh, over the past decade plus, uh, we've done over a thousand projects, saving our customers over a billion dollars uh, in energy costs, uh, uh, reducing carbon emissions. Um, and uh, that market um, is, a, uh, is a market that our customers demand us to keep them on the proven edge of technology, not on the cutting edge of technology. Because the one thing about the energy industry and, and energy infrastructure that maybe is a little different than how we think about purchasing other things like maybe our, uh, our IT equipment uh, that you're thinking, well, you know, I'll make this decision and I'm going to, you know, turn this over in three years anyway. So, you know, it's not a, you know, not a huge decision. It's an important one, but 
you know, if it's a bad decision three years later, I can, I can fix it. Uh, your energy infrastructure, you're making decades, multiple decades long decisions. Um, so you have to choose very wisely. And you don't want science experiments uh, at your facility. Uh, think about if you're the, you know, on the school board, you don't want to be the person that has to live in that community and walk around as, as being the, you know, the guy who made the bad call on the solar project or the, or the wind project at, at, at the school district. Uh, the next market that, uh, that we look at is actually our single largest customer, which is Chevron itself. Chevron has a huge energy demand in producing energy. Uh, all around the world, we, we have over a $7 billion annual energy spend. And over the past uh, 30 years, as we've doubled the size of the company, we've reduced our energy demand by 30%. So we go all around the world uh, and we look at energy efficiency, power system reliability, and renewable power opportunities to reduce our own demand. So uh, we learn uh, from the marketplace, uh, but we also apply it to ourselves. And then lastly, uh, we look at uh, large-scale renewable projects uh, that we invest in uh, and that we, we typically build. Uh, Chevron is the largest producer of geothermal energy in the world. Uh, so we look at geothermal projects, uh, we look at large-scale solar projects, wind projects, uh, waste energy projects. Um, and so the, uh, the question, Matthew, is you know, how do we deploy the new stuff? How do you pick? and choose it. Well, first of all, uh, we meet with um, virtually every new technology uh, company that's in energy, um, and, and a couple of things we do. One is we have a venture capital arm that may actually make an investment in that company, and what we're typically looking for is their technology transfer to some part of Chevron's global operations. You want to invest in what you know so we don't you know, tend to look at technology startup companies that we don't see a tech transfer opportunity. Um, so we're looking at energy uh, type technologies. Um, and another thing that we do is we, we meet with those uh, technologies, even ones that, that we don't invest in, and uh, we want to partner with them early. We want to provide them with real market feedback. Uh, we want to be able to get in there early enough to say, you know, if you develop your technology this way, we think you're going to have a hard time finding a market for it. But if you could do this with it, we think we could put that into every one of our customers' facilities. And there's been examples where I've gone in and looked at a new technology, and you know, in essence, my business, we're, we're general contractors. So a lot of times I've got my general contractor hat on, and I go in and see the technology, and the scientists are all really excited about the technology, and, and it's got great lab results, um, and they see a frown on my face. And they say, well, what aren't you excited about, Jim? You know, I'm building a spreadsheet in my head, and I'm thinking about how I'm going to install it. And before I even ask them how much their piece of equipment is, I already know that it's not competitive with the marketplace because of the challenges of what it would take to install that at one of our customers' facilities. So getting us in early to talk to them about ways that, that they can integrate that technology into a facility, into a building, into a process, uh, is a, is a real benefit that we can help provide. Uh, the next is demonstration projects. Uh, many times we'll demonstrate those projects uh, on our own facilities. Uh, Chevron will play host to do technologies. Uh, we demonstrated a, a large concentrating solar uh, power tower uh, here in central California in, in Colinga, uh, which is basically um, where we take 65 acres of mirrors uh, direct the sunlight on a boiler on a stick. So 350 feet up in the air, you know, we, we direct the sun to that and we make steam. And rather than taking that steam to power, we take that steam into our oil field operations uh, for enhanced oil recovery where we need to heat up the oil with steam, uh, increase the viscosity so we can, we can pump it out of the ground. Uh, we test all kinds of different technologies on ourselves, and, and the reason why we like to do that is not only to help those technologies prove themselves out, but we get to learn from them. We get to learn about how to deploy those technologies, how they perform, because at the end of the day, when they become commercialized, you know, they have to be bankable, they have to be able to be financeable, um, and what a great way for, you know, you talk to uh, the banks and, you know, investors by saying you've demonstrated on a Chevron facility. Uh, and in 
uh, addition, uh, typically once we deploy that technology commercially and put it into our customers' facilities, uh, we have to stand behind it. Uh, so Chevron has to uh, stand behind that, that solution that we provide to that customer. Um, so if I've gotten to, uh, to experience the development process, I'm more comfortable putting the Chevron brand and our name behind that, that technology. Uh, so uh, at the end of the day, what we hope to be is the sales distribution channel uh, for those new technologies. Uh, but the challenge at the end of the day is the customers don't want science experiments and the customers make their decisions primarily based on economics. I'd like to start the Q&A portion of this program by asking a question to each of the panelists and then opening it up to questions to the, uh, the uh, participants here. Uh, we'll start with David. Um, you mentioned fracking as being a pretty fundamental effect on the industry. Um, I have to ask you a question what your opinions are on the environmental impact of fracking, both you mentioned water potentially, uh, directly being the first uh, question. Could you talk about that more in, in general? Where do you come out on that? Do you think it's something environmentalists should be alarmed by? Do you think there's enough knowledge about this yet or how far along are we? Well, thank you. I, I think I can understand the environmental community has is really torn about this issue because um, fracking un unlocks a huge new supply of natural gas. Natural gas is the cleanest of fossil fuels, but it doesn't have zero emissions. And there's all this evidence growing about the impacts of fracking itself on the environment, on the water table, on a variety of other uh, uh, effects. So. This is, this is a, in some sense, this is one of the most important strategic challenges, I think, for the environmental community right now, at least as relates to, to energy. As I see it, the environmental community needs to do two things. First, they need to develop a strategy so that we actually understand which of these impacts are real and which of them are, 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 not, are, are, are not real. Uh, this is coming out right now with all the controversy around whether fracking operations cause more greenhouse gas emissions, particular methane, which is a very strong greenhouse gas. Some people say that will completely offset the carbon dioxide benefits of, of, uh, of natural gas. I, I don't think that the evidence points in that direction right now, but we, don't, we just don't know. And, and some, a similar program needs to be developed around all of these major, uh, major impacts. A few environmental groups are moving in this direction. But I think first, the environmental community needs to develop some kind of strategy about how we make fracking safe. What I see going on right now is the industry and the environmental community are just talking past each other. Folks in the industry say, we know how to do this safely. And folks in the environmental community are looking at uh, extreme events and saying, these are happening all the time. And the two sides aren't really getting together. And, and, and I think while we know how to do this safely, or I think we think we know how to do this safely, what we don't yet know how to do is make sure all the operators in all these fields actually follow those, uh, follow those norms. And that's going to require a role for at least self-policing by the industry, probably a role for regulation, smart regulation, and so on. So that's first. The second is the environmental community has to work exactly on what Ernie uh, Moniz said, which is um, if you're really worried about climate, then you need to view gas, at least gas with conventional electric technologies, as a bridge. And the question is whether you're going to get to the end of the bridge and just fall off or whether you're going to end, end up being someplace. And I'm very worried that we can buy 10 years by switching to gas and with efficiency and so on, but then we're just going to mess around during those 10 years. And I think in particular right now with all the fiscal pressures on governments, you know, the countries that have spent the most money uh, in this area are almost all going through just massive public budget crises of various forms. And they've been able to hide some of these costs by pushing them onto ratepayers. But I, I worry that we're going to not be able to sustain the spending on R&D and the smart spending on R&D needed so that we buy 10 years and then we actually have some better low carbon emission technologies in the future. Actually, that's great. That leads to my question for you, Ari. Actually, can I comment on this first? Yeah, well, that was going to be my question anyway. How do we, what do we do with this time that we're buying? What should we do with that time? Okay, yeah. uh, good. But I want to go back to first to the first part of David's uh, answer. And I, I, and I want to uh, agree with him but be less nuanced. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> when two professors uh, have a nuanced <coughs> debate, it's going to end badly. The, uh, <laughs> well, because uh, uh, David used the words, uh, the accumulating environmental evidence in fracking, and I think that could lead some to misinterpret that as, uh, as that there is, in fact, lots of hard evidence uh, in terms of contamination of this or that. Uh, the, just to clarify, 
uh, from the fracking itself, and I think David would agree, there is no evidence today of the fracking itself uh, being, being, uh, having caused any contamination of groundwater or anything. And that's why when David said we think this can be managed, it's because it's not the fundamentals of that process. It's the question of how you properly complete and cement your well uh, going in. It's how you properly manage the water that you've taken back uh, on, onto the surface. This is not rocket science. Nevertheless, I agree with David, it's gotta be, it's gotta be managed and regulated properly, but it's not some fundamental issue in terms of the fracturing process yeah. itself. No, you didn't say yeah. that, but I just wanted to make sure that that, that was clear. And similarly, on, on the methane emissions, again, I will be less uh, nuanced. I think uh, just about everybody agrees that the uh, methane leaks, uh, not only have they been, uh, or escaped, not only has it been greatly reduced through what are called uh, green completions, but in fact, the amount is, is not in any way of the scale that would negate the impact or the benefit of gas for coal. So again, some may criticize that, but I would just want to be a little bit harder on the, on the issue because it is a very, very important, uh, very important issue. Now, however, on the question of buying time, <clears throat> uh, and David reinforced this, uh, uh, the signs are not all positive that we will not fritter away uh, this opportunity <laughs> to, uh, uh, to, to, to move, the ball, We've done uh, before. move the ball forward. Yeah. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, and let's face it, uh, we, as, as David said, I mean, budgets are obviously pretty tight, uh, public budgets uh, in all dimensions. But to put a scale to it, a variety of groups, uh, including uh, um, CEOs of non-energy companies, the American Energy Innovation Council, the President's Council of Advisors and others, all come to a rough idea that we are probably underinvesting by roughly a factor of three in terms of public funds, in terms of innovation uh, and driving these technologies. Look at what I just mentioned earlier. Uh, well, I didn't mention all of them. For example, in photovoltaics, uh, there's the issue of uh, how to get new materials new, using nanotechnology to create PV for new markets. Huge opportunity. Uh, uh, nuclear, I mentioned the small modular reactors uh, as an issue. S concentrated solar thermal. Uh, improvements in one's ability to store the energy for some time could lead to a great improvement uh, in, in, uh, in uh, matching to, uh, to loads. Uh, CCS, uh, uh, carbon capture and sequestration. We need, there are a whole bunch of ideas, novel ideas about how to have new technologies to lower costs. You know, in, in the R&D business, let's face it, you gotta bet on a lot of possibilities and, and, and a, few, a few will pan out. Uh, we, first of all, are under-investing. Secondly, there is the issue of how we uh, do or do not uh, support the deployment end of the, uh, of the spectrum. Uh, and here, uh, I think we have lots of room for improvement, particularly by going back to the future. Uh, uh, there are th exactly the business of unconventional gas and how it developed provides a very interesting history lesson going back to the late 70s and through the 80s as to how one might structure public, quasi-public, and tax incentives of limited duration to encourage market penetration a, ultimately a market-tested technology uh, to scale. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, if we could get over the uh, unproductive harangues and just sit down and design some of these systems using uh, uh, some historical precedent, I think we could, we could uh, move the ball. I think we'll be coming back to uh, incentives in a few minutes and some of the questions here. But if I can move to Lori and uh, change the topic a little bit for a second around away from climate change and more to security which is a big part of, of technology and sort of the, of the energy sector. Um, we talk about smart grid technologies. How is it going to lead to hopefully a more secure uh, energy sector? Uh, or are there some other uh, maybe negative consequences by going in that direction? You know, I, I really think it's sort of a good news, bad news um, story. 
The, the good news is, as we have a smarter grid, we have a better instrumented, more ubiquitous monitoring of the grid. And so if there are anomalies, we can detect them much more quickly. Uh, we have the ability for pieces of the grid to self-report um, if there are things that are going wrong. Uh, we're also moving gradually toward uh, a more distributed architecture so that communities could be islanded. So if there's a problem with one part of the grid and uh, other pieces of it can stay up. But as we add intelligence and as we add connectivity to the grid, we have to add security. They really all have to come together. And I think we're a little behind on that piece of it. Um, Intel, um, a lot of you probably know, one of our subsidiaries is McAfee, um, the security company. And so we're starting to put a lot more focus on cybersecurity, and there is a lot of work to do. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Jim, my question to you is around uh, your reaction to the shale gas question, and if you agree with the other panelists or the difference of opinion. Is this actually something which is buying us time? Um, is it sucking the energy or the, um, the, uh, the oxygen out of the renewable space from your perspective? Uh, is it making it more difficult for you to get past the benchmarks? Because now for renewable projects, they look a lot less attractive at a relative mm -hmm. scale, at least in the near term. So I guess the, the answer is it's too early to tell. Um, what we really compete uh, against is the price of electricity. And so when you're, when you're looking at, um, say, merchant power opportunities, so the, the output of the project is going to be sold into the grid, typically through a power purchase agreement with a utility, I believe it's 29 states in the United States have what's called a renewable portfolio standard, uh, which is uh, mandates on utilities in that state, how much of their generation portfolio has to be from renewable sources. Uh, so the, the whole shale gas revolution hasn't hit you know, state PUCs, uh, public utilities commissions, um, around are we gonna change the RPS standards? Are we gonna leave those mandates alone or are we gonna change them in light of this? Uh, so right now, we're still you know, negotiating power purchase agreements with utilities to build large-scale solar, uh, geothermal projects, um, and nothing really is, has, has changed yet. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see a reaction at some point in time from, from state uh, PUCs. Um, at the uh, distributed generation level, so behind utilities grid level, it, it's, uh, uh, it, there is competition with natural gas uh, for solar, uh, and then because you can now look at uh, you know cheap natural gas cogeneration, and you know those uh, those numbers uh, penciling out pretty competitively right now, mm -hmm. and so uh, with the expiring of some of the solar incentives and things like that, we are seeing that there's uh, uh, there's more competitive pressure uh, from natural gas. Well, great. Let me take a question from the audience, um, and Ernie, maybe for you, I think. But uh, it's a, what are your thoughts on government incentives? as an effective means for accelerating clean tech innovation? Well, as I, as I indicated, uh, there certainly is a, <laughs> there's a history of, uh, of government being very important in terms of, uh, of advancing technology. C certainly, and I think, I, think, I think, first of all, no one, uh, I think this question is not referring to the R&D phase where I think most people are certainly in agreement that at the early stages, the government is an essential uh, in, in investor. This, I think, is more at the deployment stage, mm -hmm. and where the arguments are are much more difficult. Uh, and uh, and I personally believe should be structured along the lines uh, I obliquely referred to it in terms of this earlier history, along the lines of does a particular incentive over a finite and defined amount of time have a reasonable expectation of bringing the technology into a competitive position in the marketplace. And that would be a test that some of the incentives would pass and some would fail. Fair enough. Can I just, uh, very briefly on this, I think you're being too nuanced, Darren. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just want to add to this that I think one of the big challenges for government here is also to create a mechanism to insulate this activity from the politics that we see now around Solyndra yes. and so on. Because if you really do this with a portfolio of really exciting ideas, 
some of these have to fail. And in fact, our failure rate right now is probably too low. It's a, it may be a sign that we're not taking enough risks. And so you need a mechanism, even at the demonstration phase, where you can put big money on the table for defined periods of time, insulate the government in a wise way around kind of an endless commitment to these technologies, uh, but nonetheless to back a whole bunch of them. And, and I think we are not, in energy, which is very much in the public space, we've not been very good at this. Maybe we've been better at this in other areas like in defense and so on. This remains, I think, a big, big challenge. I think it's a very important point. I guess as one for, uh, for Donnie, I'm going to completely agree with David. In fact, we, we f certainly have advocated for, and as of many, for things like quasi-government corporations for large-scale demonstrations, et cetera. But the model I was discussing earlier had another, another feature. And that was when it was really at the, apply, at the applied end and the, the development. It was done through a small charge on energy, uh, unnoticeable in the consumer bills, but of course it raises all kinds of flags. Uh, uh, it was done at that time. It was a period of regulation. Deregulation has not been the friend of these kinds of approaches. And very importantly, in those cases, the program structure was determined in a process that involved industry. And I believe we need that for this downstream end, getting industry involved. And I would go a step further. I would make these regional organizations because different regions of our country have very different ideas about how to pursue a clean energy agenda. And our failure to recognize that in national policy making has doomed us to all kinds of dead ends. Great, thank you. Uh, this is a question I think maybe for you, David. Uh, what is the timeline for America's energy independence? I, I hate the term energy independence. I, it polls well because people like to be independent or for the most part, they like to be independent and so on. Uh, of course, it's a complete fantasy, even if we are... are 47%. 40, oh, 40, okay. <laughs> but that's where the 47% came from. Um, the, the, um, now, if we are net producing as much energy as we consume, it's possible we'll see that over the next, uh, next decade or so. It really depends on how you do the math, though, because if you do add up all the energy sources, we often forget that the vast majority of what goes into our electric grid is already produced at home, and we're not import dependent on that at all. The, the real independence debate about energy right now relates to transportation, uh, relates to transportation and yeah. relates to oil, uh, oil in particular. If we were to become actually independent and try and somehow put walls around us and so on, which is what some people are implying, our energy security absolutely would go down dramatically because we, in times of shortage, depend on international markets, not only for crude oil, but for products, gasoline, jet fuel, and so on. On that, and that produces, uh, on balance, a tremendous amount of security. Uh, Lori, um, how has smart grid technology advanced electricity networks? I think the question is trying to get at basically what's happened already today. Like, what's, what smart grid technologies have been deployed already, and what kind of difference has that made to this uh, to date? Yeah, I, I, it's a really interesting question. In the U.S., we're um, fairly far along in terms of getting smart meters deployed, um, which for, the, I think, the first phase uh, really more benefited utilities than it did consumers um, because it enabled a lot of operational efficiency, right? They didn't have to roll trucks anymore to read the meters. Um, we're starting to see a lot of momentum, though, now around the data from the meters being shared with consumers. And this has actually been an interesting role of government in that uh, the White House put in place a program called Green Button which uh, really just advocated for the utilities to make the uh, meter data available to the consumer. They opt in. It's, it's still their data. It's, you know, all the privacy um, considerations are addressed. Um, but it's caused a real proliferation of applications to develop to make the information more useful. And I've, uh, I've been lucky enough to be included in the White House Open Data Initiative and the, particularly the one focused on energy. And it's just been fascinating to watch the applications that have sprung up to take advantage of the green data. And we're just at the very beginning. You know, the White House has this vision of 
energy data becoming the equivalent in terms of spurring innovation as uh, weather data has or GPS information. I mean, think of all the incredible things we can do now because of GPS. And so, you know, we'll, we'll see more and more of that innovation now happen around energy, which I think is very, very cool. Cool. Uh, this may be a question, I think, maybe for Jim or for uh, uh, the other panelists. Uh, it's a question about photovoltaics and about its future in, in terms of how large it can eventually get in terms of our solution. Um, is it going to be mainstream or produce a large portion of our, of our power in the future? When will that happen? Well, from a, you know, from a market reality you know, perspective, uh, you know, renewables uh, are low density mm -hmm. um, as compared to fossil fuels. And you need a lot of acreage to uh, produce uh, you know, a fair amount of power. Um, if you look at the Ivanpah you know, project uh, down um, in, uh, in southern Vegas, uh, south of Vegas, um, you know, I believe it's 3,000 acres uh, to produce, and it's uh, concentrating solar power, uh, to produce about the equivalent of 150 megawatts uh, equivalent uh, natural gas uh, combined cycle cogen plant would need about 60 acres. Uh, so, you know, it's a uh, it, it's a real challenge when you when you look at you know the the amount of acreage that that you would need to produce a significant you know amount of power, um, and and that's the that's the limiting factor on, <coughs> on renewables. Um, the other thing I would say about renewables, um, as compared to say the the shale gas revolution we're talking about, is is that it appears to be more evolutionary than revolutionary. Um, you know, I've been in this business for, you know, for 25 years. And, you know, looking at the, the pace of renewables, um, it, you know, it, there's, there's real limitations, uh, you know, to the development of them. Um, you know, we've got a, a, a project that's the, uh, the nation's largest uh, smart grid project. It's not far from here in Alameda County uh, at the uh, Santa Rita Jail which is the fifth largest county jail in the United States and the greenest jail in the United States. Um, in, in 2001, uh, we uh, put, and they have about three megawatt load, uh, we put in about a 1.2 megawatt uh, solar system. Uh, then in, I think, 2005, uh, we put in a one megawatt fuel cell. Uh, then 2008, 2009, we did some energy efficiency and water conservation measures. Um, by the way, you know, as you can imagine a jail, it's a 24-7 operation. And we don't want to lose power there. It's, you know, the sheriffs appreciate it as, as well as a lot of, a lot of the inmates. Um, in 2010, uh, we put about five uh, small uh, wind turbines uh, on the site. And then last year, uh, we put in an um, advanced storage system, uh, battery storage system. Uh, which allowed uh, the jail to now island off the grid. So it is, it's the, the nation's largest search uh, grid, which is the consortium uh, for electric reliability technology solutions uh, in the nation. A and it's a really exciting project. Uh, we're really proud of it, but it took us a decade, you know, to get there. And what we hope is we can learn a lot from that so that, you know, <coughs> the next smart grid project you know, will happen much faster. But, but that's some of the challenges is waiting for the technology advance to the point where, you know, you can actually reliably deploy it commercially. Can I uh, say add, add to that? I mean, I think the, uh, uh, Jim says is obviously, by the way, I, I, earlier, the tone in which you said science projects really disturbed <laughs> me. Uh, but, uh, the, uh, um, but this question of, for example, low density and, and lots, of, lots of area, uh, well, obviously it's true that it's, it's, it's low density. But one shouldn't get the impression that one has to you know, pave over the whole United States with, uh, with PV panels to get uh, uh, a lot of energy. And in particular, if one's talking about a fairly rational you know, 25% of electricity or so, uh, this is really, I mean, I think the, in the end, the space is not going to be the challenge. Other things will be a challenge, like storage, uh, for example. Uh, so storage technologies are absolutely critical. The only point I want to make as well is that often we tend to just isolate one technology 
and it's really the combination of technologies can be can work together much better. Now, storage is an obvious example, but another example is suppose you're driving lights. Well, driving LEDs instead of incandescents uh, tremendously lowers your requirements uh, on the generation and, and on the storage. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of similar similar stories in terms of how you would build a vehicle. Uh, you know, if, if we keep going on by saying that an electric vehicle is a car designed by Henry Ford with a battery put in it, uh, you know, well, okay, we're going to put major requirements on the batteries, but we can redesign the whole vehicle in a new way with a fundamentally different platform. So I think, I, uh, again, I, I remain... Uh, um, more optimistic. Yeah, and I think when you talk about distributed generation as well, solar has very yeah. unique characteristics. Well, right? with PV as opposed to C, as PV, opposed yeah. to CSP. Yeah, right. exactly true. Uh, the next question is actually another technology which has not been discussed, which is biofuel. What are what are your views on uh, the prospects of that? That's where it's running. Who? Yeah, me. I think you, <laughs> if you want to. Um, <clears throat> sure. Well, of course, uh, uh, this this is another technology, and I'm, I'm talking now about next generation biofuels, of course, and not, uh, not uh, burning food. Uh, the, um, uh, you know, we're talking about another technology that's on the order of a decade away. Uh, uh, I mean, the fact is that uh, next generation biofuels using cellulosic uh, feedstocks uh, just are not cost competitive uh, today. I think logical, logical extensions would again say that 10, 15 years is kind of the right time scale for the potential for, for scaling. So we're back to our, <laughs> our time scale again and using the time effectively. But the other point I'll make again, just following the last one, is uh, we shouldn't think of this in isolation. It's not like biofuels are going to displace 8 million uh, barrels a day of gasoline uh, in the United States. But if we have much more efficient vehicles, if we have a whole bunch of hybrid vehicles, uh, the, then the mix of oil, biofuels, perhaps natural gas to liquids, methanol, uh, et cetera, uh, gives us a lot of opportunities for flexibility in our, in our liquid fuel uh, mix. Here's a question, uh, which is, how does the U.S. compare to Europe in developing and implementing renewable technologies? And uh, David, you may have talked about this, also not just in Europe, but also maybe just broadly in the world. How do we uh, compare in both developing and deploying? Well, so the uh, major European countries, I would say Germany in particular, but not only Germany, have made massive investments in renewables. Mm -hmm. And um, they poll extremely well. There's tremendous public support for them, uh, and the German case in particular is interesting to watch right now because of this commitment, which I'm not sure the German government will be able to follow through with, to eliminate their nuclear reactors and go all renewables. Um, traditionally, the European, we use in this country a combination of production incentives, one of the, which is about to expire, but who knows what will happen in Washington, and these 29 states with their various kinds of renewable portfolio standards. And in effect, what happens is when these, fuel, when these energy sources become less competitive on their own, then the renewable portfolio standards become a much more binding influence, which is what you're seeing in the power purchase agreements uh, that your company has been working on. Um, the, the European approach has been quite different, which is to, to have feed-in tariffs and to pay people directly. And while there's been a lot of improvements in reducing the feed-in tariffs and getting them better lined up so that people aren't making money for just ridiculously stupid projects, uh, the feed-in tariff strategy uh, does encourage and has historically encouraged a tremendous amount of waste. And we see in the Spanish solar market the kind of swings, boom and bust cycles and so on. And I, I think the Europeans are still trying to get their, 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 their groove as to how they're going to have large amounts of renewables and yet make that cost effective. I know, I know industry, who are going to be buying this electricity, are worried about that as this affects their, their competitiveness. The Chinese market is interesting to watch right now. There, there's, a, there's a big Chinese market for wind at home a lot of which is not actually connected to the grid. These are projects that people just go off and build for local incentives. Um, the Chinese, the, the main role that the Chinese have played in the renewables market, though, has been as producers. I mean, they just, they have uh, uh, cleaned the floor in terms of production of, uh, of some forms of solar cells. Uh, they might play a similar role in, uh, in parts of wind, tur in the wind turbines and maybe even blades. Um, uh, that's a little harder to see. 
This question is uh, about some far out technology around uh, fusion reaction and how we've uh, cut funding for this at the federal level apparently. Anyone want to take that one? That's you, Arnie. Well, uh, in looking at the climate Ten challenge, uh, looking at the climate challenge, I've always uh, taken a mid-century time horizon. Okay. Uh, that is, um, uh, <laughs> historically, because of the energy industry, it takes that length of time to change things, and yet that's kind of the drop-dead date for addressing climate in any, in any serious way. Consequently, fusion has never been part of our calculations. I think we have time for one last question. Um, uh, we'll talk about another technology which is out there, and I think it's been brought up a number of times, which is around storage. So uh, how will battery technology evolve, and in particular the cost of uh, storage, in particular what, what alternative options do we have? Well, on the commercial side, I mean, we're, we're still uh, waiting for the technology to develop, although there are uh, some battery technologies that uh, we're able to deploy uh, like in the, the Santa Rita jail example. Um, one interesting thing about, you know, the, uh, the back to the, the shale gas revolution, you know, is that, that natural gas is actually a nice complementary storage to renewable projects. You know, where you have intermittent power, you combine that with uh, natural gas uh, generation, and you, you do have storage. Uh, so I think um, Ernie's exactly right in that, you know, it's not one technology, it's, it's the combination. It, it's you know, being able to combine the various different technologies along with the energy efficiency to create the ideal uh, solutions. There isn't one silver bullet uh, answer. So I think for, uh, for utility storage, then gas today operationally is, uh, I totally agree, the, the, the balancing. But if we turn to the automotive sector, uh, there, uh, uh, you get lots of different numbers, but I personally I would say if you look at the cost today of a lithium-ion based uh, automotive battery system, uh, you're probably talking six to seven hundred dollars per kilowatt hour of storage. Now what does that mean? Uh, if you want a car with a long range, driving range, on batteries, you're probably talking about needing, say, 80 kilowatt hours. 80 kilowatt hours times $600 turns out to be a fair amount of money for a battery. Um, if you're talking about a <coughs> plug-in hybrid where the battery, uh, or a short range, short distance vehicle, maybe you're talking 15 kilowatt hours and now you're talking about the kinds of premiums we're seeing today. Now, if one takes the kind of a, what I would call a standard trajectory of uh, cost reduction, I think one could be talking certainly $300 by the end of this decade and maybe $150 by, let's say, 2030. You, know, mm -hmm. you pick your number, but I, I'd think that's a rational number. So the arithmetic remains times 80, it's still a big number, but times 40, hmm, now we're talking. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, time, times 15, 15 kilowatt hours, uh, 40 miles, I think 40 miles, uh, 15 kilowatt hours times 150 bucks, $2,000, many opportunities to get costs out of an electric driven vehicle as well. So once again, we're in this now 10, 15 kind of year time frame I think before a whole set of these technologies are ready to begin their market penetration in some 